Good morning, church. So good to be with you. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Gary Osborne. I'm on staff here. And as I was just thinking about the songs we were singing, it's like, ah, my life has been transformed by Jesus and I'm free. And that's why I get to stand here and share what Christ has done in my life. And I think about these men and women that we've been talking about this summer, these unsung heroes, their lives were transformed by being um, around Jesus and by being connected to the Father. And so they lived a different life. It was their faith that was able to grow. This summer, that's kind of been my prayer for the church, that we would hear these little stories, these tidbits of men and women whose faith were expanded and they lived differently, that that would become part of our life that we would grow in our trust in the Lord as we study these men and women, that our trust would grow deeper and deeper. We'd have a stronger faith because we had seen how God worked in the lives of these people. This morning, we're going to take a look at maybe a character that's been overlooked in the New Testament. And I'm going to share this story with you because this story has had an enormous impact on my personal journey with Jesus, on my life and how I've gotten to the place that I'm at. So if you want to grab a Bible, if you have your tablet, or if you want to grab one in front of you, you can turn to Mark 14. Mark 14 is in the New Testament. It's one of the four Gospels. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so Mark's kind of right in there towards the back of the Bible. This is one of the few stories that actually shows up in all four of the Gospels. Some have a sentence or two about it. Some have an expanded version. But I wanted to land here in Mark 14 because it's one that almost leaves the woman with a little bit of mystery. And you might not know exactly who she is until you do a little further study. So this story is located in the context of opposition, misunderstanding, and the impending suffering of Jesus. The religious leaders were plotting to kill Jesus, and Judas is conspiring with them. So we're going to kind of look at the bookends of Mark 14, kind of 1 through 11, and we're going to really hone in on 3 through 9 today. So here it is in Mark 14, 1 and 2. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. So right now you can see that the religious leaders, they're, they're done with him. Jesus has had a three-year ministry going on now. There's people who are following him. They're pulling them away from from the religious leaders of the time, and they're frustrated and want to end it now so that they can go back to the power that they have. And then you're also going to see that one of Jesus' closest followers, one of the 12, Judas, is right in the midst of the conspiracy. So in verse 10, if you flip down, it says, Then G Judas Iscariot, who is one of the 12, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And when they had heard it, they were glad and promised to give him the money, and he sought an opportunity to betray him. So that's just where we are in the story. And we have this beautiful little passage of a woman whose life has been transformed, who loves Jesus in an incredible way and expresses it to him. And so that's what's kind of going on as we, as we get into the text. And I think it's a really important thing to understand that, like, at this point, lots of followers, things are changing, momentum's building, so they want to end it. Yet there's this woman that we're going to get to experience whose life was transformed, who does this beautiful thing to Christ. So verse 3. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, he was reclining at the table. A woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. Now, this is a great picture of what happens when someone is just radical for the kingdom of God. This um, was a very expensive bottle of perfume. The NIV renders it saying it was a year's worth of wage. Some translations say Translations say 300 denarii. So this was very, very expensive. I was doing a little research 
um, about the median household income in Erie, Colorado today. So just, let's just think about this. This jar of perfume, according to what I looked, is worth $125,000 today. So just keep that in your mind. The dollar amount isn't important. The understanding is it's very expensive. Think about for your family or for yourself, what does it cost us a year? What do we make a year? And that's the value of this jar. But it's probably even more than that because it was probably a family heirloom that was passed from generation to generation. Most likely it came from India. It was an export. This was something very, very special. And so just hold that in the back of your mind as we talk about the woman's actions. If you read this account in the book of John, we learn that the woman here is actually Mary. Which Mary, you ask, because there's lots of them, right? Is it Mary, the mother of Jesus? No, we don't think so. Is it Mary um, Magdalene? No, we don't think it's her. We really think it's Mary, who is the brother or the, the sister of Lazarus and the sister of Martha. And so we get a little glimpse of who this Mary is in her journey with Jesus over the, the gospel story. And we see this one account where there's Mary and Martha and they're hosting a party. And Mary is just so in love with Jesus that she's just sitting at his feet, learning from him over and over again, soaking up all the knowledge that he had. And at the same time, Martha's trying to host this dinner party and she's busy serving and working away. And she gets a little bit frustrated and she's like, oh, why is this the case? I do all the work and she just sits there. And Jesus kindly says to her, and basically, Mary has chosen the better to sit at my feet, to abide in me, to really learn from me. And, and it happens in my life. I resonate way more with Martha personally. Like, hey, we got to get things done. There are things that have to happen. And sitting is very difficult. But the desire to abide in Christ needs to be something that we long for. So that's one picture we get of who Mary is. The other one is in John 11. And we learn of the death of a man named Lazarus and who was the brother of Mary and Martha. He was sick, remember, and Jesus didn't come immediately upon hearing of his illness. And then Mary came to Jesus saying, if you had only been there, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and he was greatly troubled and he wept. Remember, that's where that verse, the shortest verse in the Bible comes from, is Jesus wept. He went to the tomb of Lazarus. He prayed and he called Lazarus out of the tomb and then Lazarus came out. Mary had been touched by the living God. She was transformed by the work of Jesus in her life. And that's when we get to Mark 14, is that Mary has this extravagant love for her Savior, and she expresses it by breaking this jar of perfume, pure nard, that was worth a year's worth of wages. That's a lot to me to think about. It's really difficult for me to think about. I mean, I walk around my house, I don't know if there's anything that's actually worth more than like $200 any of the, any of the more, but to think about taking something of this extraordinary value and just what would seem to be throwing it away, using it in an inappropriate way is very difficult for me. But that's what I see happens in the life of people who've had an encounter with Christ. And I don't just see it here in God's word. I see it all the time with people here in this church. I think of those who are like Dorothy and Grant and Trisha who have been helping with the Afghan families and just the amount of work that they do and they want to be with them. I just know like Dorothy and Grant over the past couple weeks, they arranged their vacation schedule to have their planes land at the same time as some of our Afghan friends. Like they're just so invested because Christ has changed them. They want to do whatever they can to help this family know Jesus by loving them as deeply as they possibly can. I see it 
in a variety of different people. Like, I don't know if you guys know this, but we have staff members here that we don't pay because they just want to be on the team and they want to serve in whatever capacity they can. And they're like, I just want to do whatever I can for the kingdom of God. And that is an extraordinary amount of love. And so I see when people's lives have been transformed by Christ, they do radical, insane things for the kingdom of God. They become dangerous for the kingdom of God. And so when an unbelieving world looks at some of the lives of Christians, they think we're crazy because it's unexplainable how we spend our time, our talents, and our treasures because we've been confronted with the love of Christ and it changes who we are. And it doesn't make a lot of sense to those who don't know Jesus. And so that's where we are with this woman is she's worshiping the Lord by breaking this alabaster jar and pouring it on him. It reminds me a little bit of like Romans 12, 1 and 2. This is what our lives should be like, right, friends? Is therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your lives as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is true and proper worship. And we do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but we're transformed by the renewing of our mind, and then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, perfect will. This is what happens when we encounter the living God and he transforms our lives. We do things that don't make sense to an unbelieving world. And for someone to then to break a jar of $125,000 and just pour out this oil for him to smell good at a dinner party seems very strange to us. All of our life is worship. That's what this woman is doing. She's saying, Lord, everything I have, anything of value, I want you to have it because she understood who he was in that moment. So let's go back to the text and pick it up in verse four. There were, so the woman breaks the jar, the, the, the alabaster jar and she pours it over his head. And then in verse four, it says this, there were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? For the ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor, and they scolded her. Now, I, I, want, I want you to put yourself in this room. They're at this dinner party of Simon the leper. They're all gathered around. It's probably Jesus' closest father's followers. And when we get into the the um, account in the book of John, we actually learn that it's Judas who's the one who probably says this. And think about this. When you see someone who is loving Christ because they're just overwhelmed by what he's done with them, there's done to, with, and changed their life, there's probably a little bit of guilt. And I think that's what's happening in Judas at this point is he sees how this woman is responding um, and worshiping him. And so he's saying, wait a second, you're missing the point. That could have been sold and we could have given that money to the poor. I think his heart was just in the wrong place because he didn't understand this was just a true act of worship. And so he says, why the waste? You wasted this. You wasted the perfume. I think we hear that a lot in our lives. Why are you wasting your time going to church on a Sunday morning? Why are you throwing away your money when you give it to the church? Why are you going to another country on a mission trip? What a waste. You could take that money and go on a sweet vacation. Why are you giving up a week to hang out with six and seven-year-olds at your church in the middle of summer? What a waste. We could go on and on and on about how an unbelieving world perceives the way we live our lives because they don't understand that when you're transformed by the living God, you live differently. Right, friends? That's what happens. When we are radical for Jesus, the world says we are wasting our lives, our money, our time. Now, this became a critical passage in my own life. And if you don't know my story, let me just share a little bit. I grew up in Southern California, and I moved to this incredible conservative town called Boulder, Colorado, to, to go to college. And I was 
grew up in a Christian home, but I didn't really know Jesus until I got to this conservative Christian university in Boulder, Colorado. And I had an encounter with the living God in the shower of my dorm room where I was broken and weeping and saying, I need someone, something to be the center of my life. And so that's where I found myself and knowing I needed Jesus to come and change my life. And in the midst of that, my desire, once I realized I was was not going to be a professional football player, was I wanted to be an architect. And early on, I just hit that hard in high school. I took all the classes you could take. I found an internship in high school in a mailroom of an architecture firm throughout college. I was, if, if any of you have ever known an architect student, you don't really get to hang out too much with them because they're always at the studio. I was determined, because they only gave one A in your design classes, to always get that A. And so I knew I wasn't maybe the smartest, but I could outwork. And so I just lived in that architecture studio for my four years of college because I just, that was my dream. I graduated and I went to be an architect. Then Calvary called me. I, so this is a true story. I left in December. They called me the end of January. Hey, you want to come do an internship? I was like, no, I do not. I'm living my dream. They did that for about seven months straight. And I think finally I said, okay, I'll pray about it. We'll see what God wants to do, whatever. And I prayed and God brought me back here. And I remember telling the people in the firm, what I was doing. And they looked at me like, you're crazy. You worked this hard. You've wasted your education. You've wasted those four summers of being an intern here. You've wasted your life. You're going to waste your life going and working for a church. Five years later, I ran into one of my bosses from that firm. And the firm was about 70 when I was there, and it had grown to 250 people at the time. And he looked at me, he's telling me how great it was and how everything was going. He's like, you would at least be like a junior principal now. You might even be like working up the ranks. You wasted the opportunity given. Man, that's how the world thinks. When we say, I want to put Jesus at the center of my life. And whatever the cost is, friends, and we think it's a great cost, but the reality is when Jesus is the center of everything we do, the cost is very, very little because we have an internal perspective. We don't just have a finite perspective on what happens here. But it's true. There's still that struggle that we have with everything, with our time and our talent and our treasures. Like, it's always a struggle ongoing that we have to process. Here's what Luke 9, 23 through 25 says. And he said to them all, If anyone who would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For for whoever will save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself. Let that sink in. Feel it for a minute. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world or loses and loses or forfeits himself? That doesn't mean you have to go into vocational ministry. That doesn't mean you have to... What it means is what can you, what, what is it you, what is keeping you from really worshiping God fully? And so when an unbelieving world looks at a transformed believer's life and the way we spend our time and our talents and our treasures, and they say, what a waste. What I love is the next verse here. And it says this, but Jesus said, leave her alone. How encouraging is that? How much confidence does that give you? So the world, 
Remember, do not conform to the patterns of the world. When the world looks at a believer's life, that when we're worshiping God fully, and they say, you've wasted that perfume. Jesus is the one to defend us, and he says, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. Like, these are the words I want you to remember, you know. Why the waste? Why would I waste my life for the kingdom of God? And then Jesus' word, leave her alone. The creator of the universe has your back. You're back. When you feel compelled to worship the Lord in a radical way, Jesus is the one who's going to say, leave her alone. Leave him alone. Like, not only leave her alone, but he goes on to qualify the value of her act of worship. And he says, she has done a beautiful thing. So when you give your time to care for those who are hurting, when you go and do prison ministry, when you decide to drive a bus so you can care for kids, like you are doing a beautiful thing for the Lord. She has done a beautiful thing. When we worship the Lord in radical ways, I hope you know he receives it and he thinks it is precious and beautiful. Whether it's your time or your talents, the Lord is so thankful for your sacrificial act because he sees it as an act of worship. When you get down on your hands and knees with a two-year-old, you're playing with them in the nursery. When you shovel someone's snow, when you care for those who are who are hurting, when you give generously, when you teach his word, when you spend time with him, when you sit at his feet, he, it is a beautiful thing to the Lord. Look at what is written in Matthew 10. It says this, So anyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. When you worship the Lord, he has your back. And when a world says, why are you doing this? He says, leave them alone. He acknowledges you in front of the Father. He calls you his own. You are his child. You are part of his family in his kingdom. When, the, when others look at our devotion to the Lord as wasteful, Jesus receives it as an act of worship, and it is beautiful to him. Let's go to the next verse here. It says, She has done what she could do. She has anointed my body before for burial. That phrase right there, I want you to just hold on to. She did what she could do. She has done what she could. She did what she could do. He's not asking us to do anything outside what we can do. He's just asking, what can you do for the kingdom with your abilities, with your heart, with your passion, with your time? What can you do for the kingdom of God? And, and, and let me tell you, it is so easy to look around at others with eyes of comparison and to say, oh, look at how talented they are. Look at what they can do. Oh, I can't do that. I'm not gifted that way. Friends, that is not what our Savior requires of. He's only asking what you can do. It is easy, like, let the story, I don't know if you know the story of Thomas and I. Thomas was a student in my student ministry. And at a very young age, I could see that God had gifted Thomas in an amazing way to communicate. And so I was the youth pastor and Thomas was like becoming a young volunteer. And we would have 300 person plus events. And I would have Thomas give the gospel presentation because he was a way better communicator than I was back then. And it would be easy to be jealous or to be envious of what Thomas can do. Or I look at other incredible people in this room, and there's so many of them, the way that God's gifted you all. And it would be so easy for us to compare each other to one another and say, well, I wish I could do that. I wish I could do that. That's not what the Lord has asked us to do. He's just asking you to do what you can do. What is it that you do that's unique for the kingdom of God? Because we need everyone's gifts and talent to contribute to the building up of the body so that the entire body can be mature. 
That's what Ephesians talks about. That is the desire, is that we all have gifts and talents that the Lord wants. So what is it that you can do? I think about the story of the, uh, of the parable of the talents, right? And the, the, and the master gives one person five and another person two and another person one. And the, the, the person with the five, he takes it and he goes and doubles it. And so the five talents becomes ten. And Jesus says to him, well done, good and faithful servant. And the one with the two, he goes out and he multiplies it and he comes back with four. And Jesus says to him, well done, good and faithful servant. Then there's the one who is fearful of the master and he goes and buries it, right? And Jesus says of this person, you wicked servant. You could have at least put it in the bank and gain interest off of it. This is what the Lord desires of us. This is what I long to hear when I enter eternity is that well done, good and faithful servant. I don't have all the gifts. I have a ton of flaws. I have things that I'm not very good at. But I hope that I contribute to the kingdom of God with the gifts that God has given me. And so that I can walk in with confidence when I meet my maker to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. This is what the woman could do to worship the Lord. She had an alabaster jar of pure nard that was sitting on the shelf and she wanted to show that she loved Jesus extravagantly and she was so compelled, she broke it, she poured it over him to prepare him for his burial that was going to be coming in a few days and that's what she could do. What could you do? What can you do? What is the Lord asking you to do? Let's be a community of people who are fully devoted to loving God and loving others and learning how we each personally can contribute to the kingdom of God. Because the way it goes is that like when we do what we all can do, the Lord is blessed in what we do. So let's let's wrap this up with this last verse here. Verse 9. And it says this. I, and truly, I say to you, whenever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. What a powerful last word. I wonder why this shows up in all four gospel accounts. is because the way she lived this radical love, this extravagant love for the Lord was so profound that like the story has to be told because her life was transformed. She had to do something with Jesus. And that is an incredible gift to the Lord. And then the story of her will be carried on from generation to generation because what she did. I think of this practically in our own lives, that when we live a life that's been transformed by the the gospel, and we do radical things for the Lord, and we give, and we worship fully, and we say, Lord, I want you to have all of my life, I, and I do what I can do, then part of how we impact others will be part of the gospel going from generation to generation to generation. So when you invest in a person's life, and you leave a little imprint that maybe that is part of the gospel going on from generation to generation. Can you imagine teaching teaching Billy Graham's Sunday school class, right? We've heard that story before. And that Sunday school teacher leads Billy Graham. And then Billy Graham leads hundreds and thousands of people to the Lord. But that Sunday school person had a critical role in those rest of those lives, right? That, that's compelling, friends. It's like, I want to be a part of that. You guys might know, not know Kirk and Lisa Gaskins very well, but they are faithful followers of Christ who love Jesus. And there was a season when I was doing student ministry that they would open up their home when we didn't have a building to high school students. And they were our host home. They would make dinner for all the staff every night. And then after we would go to all these home groups and there was like 40 kids in their home every week. And then the, all the staff would come back and we would stay there till all hours of the night debriefing what God had done. And they served faithfully like this for years and years and years so that we could minister to high school students. And I think about those high school students who have gone out from there, from out, out from there getting an incredible picture 
of what God had done in the Gaskins' life. And because they were so compelled, they gave freely of their home, their food. I mean, their refrigerator was always full of whatever soft drink you could possibly imagine because they loved high school students so much. And I think about those students being impacted by their lives. They're going to tell the story of Kirk and Lisa Gaskins as they go on and take the gospel to the people that they know in their life. This is what happens when you are so compelled by the love of Christ is that you waste or what the world thinks is a waste. And then Jesus says, no, leave there alone. They've done a beautiful thing. And you do what you can do. And then the gospel, you're part of the gospel story going on and on and on. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for us. We're going to continue to worship this morning by taking communion. Um, So I just would encourage you to just think about your life. And are you living a life that is, is like this woman's? who the world would say is a waste, but the Lord would say is a beautiful thing. Let's pray as we get our hearts ready to take the Lord's Supper. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this example of the woman that I come back to repeatedly to think about my own life, Lord and what I want my own life to be and to think about whatever is most valuable to me at the time that I would be willing to break it because it's, you are so much more worth it, more value than whatever I'm holding close in my heart. Lord, let my whole life, let our whole lives be worship, Lord. Let us lose it all for your sake because you are worthy, Lord. And Lord, I'm so thankful that I... <laughs> I'm loved by you that you stand next to me when a world doesn't understand and says, leave him alone. Lord, I ask that we would just do what we can do, nothing more. We'd use the gifts and talents that you've given us so that the gospel would continue to go forth and more and more people would hear about you. And Father, as we remember the work on the cross, I pray that is what transforms us that it's not a bunch of things that we do, but it's because we have been transformed by an encounter with you that we live for you. So, Father, as we gather this morning and as we remember the work of the cross, I pray that you are glorified in our lives. And we love you, Lord, in your name.